So today we're going to do a deep dive into automation inside Disguise. Specifically, I want to show how we create axes, how we assign them to different objects, and just a variety of ways to work with them. So let's go ahead and let's pull up this piece of software. Some of you may be familiar with this, some of you will not be. This is Creative Connor's Spike Mark software. I'm going to be using this for a demonstration for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's got a nice WYSIWYG appearance to it. I can load my queue, play it, and we can see the queue actually running there on the screen. <clears throat> Information about how far it's traveling. But the other reason I'm using it is because in the last year or so, Creative Commons implemented something called Posi StageNet, which is a very, very important part of our industry. Posi StageNet is kind of the closest thing we have to a standard for automation tracking. It was created in combination between VYV out in Canada and Grand MA and has definitely helped a lot. Sorry, I'm also trying to make sure other people get back into this too. Great. Cool, and now I can actually see the chat on my spare computer. I think probably the class on Friday, which was going to be EOS, may just be a, this is my setup for streaming after I figure out exactly how my setup for streaming works. So this is Spike Mark. I've got a couple different things to have to work with. We've got a panel that we'll be tracking across the back of the stage. We have a turntable here, and then we just have a chain hoist motor that I'm going to be sending the data for. So it's really pretty rudimentary stuff, movements in one axis, but we'll use that and we'll expand upon it. We'll look at parenting inside disguise and see where that brings us for everything. So this is the playback area of Creative Connors. We've got cues which can be numbered, total time and ramp time for them, so how they ramp up and down, how long the actual cue takes. Then for each of our objects, the rear tracking panel, the turntable, or I'm calling them flying panels, which is a preview to what we'll actually set up when we go into the software. You can assign one or more to each of these queues. I only did one per queue, so we have this rear panel closed, which if we load that, this is the load queue, and hit play. We can see it track back across stage until it's going to close there on center. So the rear tracking panel we've got an open and close. We've got panels out and in based off this chain motor up here. And then we also have some various turntable moves. 360 counts one direction, negative 180 counts, negative 360 counts, just rotational work. So you can see for each queue, we can set up the position that we're going to land in and the speed, how fast we're going to travel. For each of these, we also have a bunch of different options for setting up our 3D world. If we scroll down here all the way, we've got the schematic where we place everything. Distance from center, distance from plaster. I'm going to openly admit I'm absolutely abysmal with Spike Mark. I know just enough to get myself into trouble, and every so often I don't know how to get myself back out of it. But I know enough that I can set up a couple different cues so that we can use it back in D3. So the next step we want to go to is up here in show control. So they have a watch out output, which actually D3 can take, but it requires turning on D3 labs and is, I don't think it's been touched in the last almost decade now. So we're not going to use that. We're going to use Posi StageNet. So we open this window. Posi StageNet is a multicast 
protocol as opposed to something like OSC, which is going to be broadcast. You're sending it to either one location or multiple locations by hand the broadcast of that IP scheme. 236.10.10.10 is the address that we'll send it to and everything can subscribe to that address to receive it. And the default port is 56565. We'll just leave it named spike mark because that's what it is. So we can toggle on whatever access we want here in the active. In this case, rear tracking panel, turntable, and flying panels. Give them a name. One thing I've noticed, D3 will not work if you leave spaces in the name. You need to either give them a single name, like the turntable, or use an underscore. If you use spaces, the <clears throat> access that D3 tries to create from it will not function. And you can also choose the access direction that you're going to send. In this case, the turntable will rotate around the y-axis because that's straight up and down in D3. Same with those flying panels on that chain motor, which is right here. We'll transition those along the y. Meanwhile, the rear tracking panel will transition along the x. Oh, interesting. You guys don't actually see the screen I'm looking at. Hmm. That's not helpful at all. One moment. Uh, let's make a new scene. And that scene, we're going to add a source, screen capture, monitor capture, desktop two. Great. So now you should see what we're working with. Great. Other things to note about the streaming software, I've been trying to isolate it per screen, thinking that that will be a smoother workflow, but I think I need to just sh uh, share the overall screen itself instead. This is the POSI StageNet server pop-up that we get. The client address and port, again, 236-10-10-10-56565. And then the three axes we're going to send are the three motors in this case. We can also set our data interval. Currently, it's set to 30, so we're getting roughly 30 hertz. We could drop it down to 16.67 if we'd prefer it at 60. I'm going to leave it at 30 just to do the most I can not to bog down my network since there's a lot going on. And the last option is you actually need to hit send output. So now we are sending out our messages. So. In D3, I've made a new project, chat with chat 002. I haven't actually opened this project yet. Um, Greg in the chat just asked if we can unicast, and I don't actually think you can unicast Posi StageNet. I th you could probably try it. I've never done it. I've always wanted it at multicast because I need multiple things to subscribe to it. Especially since Posi StageNet talks really well with Grand MA. Lighting oftentimes wants to get access to it as well. And I needed to hit both my master and the understudy so that it can be going to all servers. So we're going to fire up chat with chat too. which will slowly load. Also, very important, today is National Manatee Day. Manatees are my favorite animal, so I'm drinking manatee out of my manatee mug. All right, so here we are in disguise. I'm going to make that 3D widget disappear because I really don't like it. Standard D3 project. I'm going to go ahead and make a new object, which will be an LED screen. Which will be my stage right panel. 
And the other thing I'm going to do is pull my projector and surface one out because I'm not going to be working with them. So some of the choices, thank you, Sean Hooper. Um, some of the choices I'm making here are going to be arbitrary because I don't have actual 3D positions for these objects. I am going to make this close based on the movement and spike mark. Actually, that's a good question. I wonder if I load this up. Cool. Great. I'm going to throw my... webcam on top of this if it will let me no it will not so we're going back to this look my surface book is trying its hardest but this is a little bit much for it so let's go ahead and let's make this three meters high two meters wide very very arbitrary placement and its offset is going to be 1.5 meters in the sky which means that it's riding right on the floor and we'll move it upstage some just to get out of the way so this is going to be the panel that we're tracking in just a second so how do we get this automation data into a point that d3 can work with it we're going to use a device. A device is anything that's going to take in or output data from D3. If you right click on devices here, we can make a new device. In this case, I'm going to call it spike mark screen position receiver, SPR for short, which is going to be a screen position receiver. This is the standard automation device that we use in Disguise, a screen position receiver. It has some pieces which are very important. The first step that we have to set up is going to be our driver. If we click the plus sign. You can see there's no driver made for the show yet. So I'm going to make one, which is just spike mark posi stage net. And it's going to be a posi stage net driver. Before I select that, you can see here are some of the other drivers that Disguise can talk. DMX screen, so if you want to move something based off of a DMX value, you can use it there. Kinesis, Navigator. Navigator also does posi stage net output, so it depends on what you want to do there. Stipe for camera. Visual ACT driver, I believe that's also a camera stage kinetics, show imaging motion driver, PRG stage commander if you're using their custom stuff, though I think they might do posi stage net too, OSC if you want to drive it through OSC. So there's a lot of options that we can work with, but my preference is usually posi stage net. <clears throat> uh, Paul in the chat is asking if there's a reason to use a navigator device instead of a screen position driver. I'm not sure what you mean by a navigator device. If you can uh, clarify that, I would, I will answer that question. So we've created a posi stage net driver. We assign to the multicast address that we're receiving from and the ports. Because Posi Station is pretty much a published profile, we get that back in properly. Notice how we have a green box around create axes now. That means that Disguise is seeing axes being sent from Spike Mark and can unpack the packet by just hitting create axis. And we now get the axis for everything that we're receiving. The problem is posi stage net, you're sending six axes of information for everything. So I'm going to go ahead and take just a brief moment to pull out some of the stuff that we're not using. And I'm also going to turn off pop-ups so that we don't see those while I'm working on this.
So these are the three axes we're actually working with for the show. The turntable, the rear panel, and the flying panels. Position Y, position X, rotation Y. So for each of these axes, we're going to start working on the rear panel, so I'll right click on it. Configuration is the first step. We're going to have to assign it to something. So the status is currently engaged. I can either engage or disengage all my axes at once or per axis if I need to isolate an axis. This is the idea of what I'm receiving. Remember how I said we don't want spaces in it? This is one of the places spaces would really mess up. Though in D3, usually spaces and underscores have been coded in to be kind of interchangeable, so you might be OK even if they're sending you that and you don't have a chance to change it by just making every space an underscore and seeing if that sorts it. So for the object, I'm going to go ahead and choose panel stage right. Its property is going to be offset.x. And you'll notice it just disappeared. Let's take a look at the values that we're receiving. We're currently receiving a value of 239 from it. And here in the range, we're not scaling that. So currently, this object is 239 meters away. So there's something really handy that we can work with, and that's called our stage reference. So stage reference, there's the D3, there's the spike mark screen position receiver. We could make a new one instead. I'm just going to edit the spike mark one. I can change my units here from meters into inches, and now we're receiving panel stage right. And it's no longer throwing itself all the way out because it's converting these values from inches here back into meters. So I'm going to actually start by opening spike mark. Let's take you there with me. So currently the rear panel is closed. I'm going to go ahead and open it to see where that takes us. So that's the zero position that we have. When it's at zero in spike mark, it's all the way open. One second while I see if I can correct this so that I can do this through spike mark now. That should work fine. So in spike mark, you can see it's here at its zero position, which is all the way open. And yet in D3, the D3 zero position brings it to the center which is not really what we're looking for. But luckily, we can fix that. And we can fix that using some math. So I'm going to set that to be the minimum input. Click set, it captures it. And that minimum input is actually going to be about minus 6. Uh, minus 240, rather, because it's going to do the conversion here. So that's going to put us 240 inches open. Then, if we take it to the closed and run the closed queue, you can see it's doing a massive scaling shift right now. But once it gets to its final point, Almost. There. So that's its final point. I can set that as the maximum input. And that maximum output is actually going to be not quite zero.
it's going to be just over since this is a meter wide it's going to be about a meter over, which if we convert from inches to meters is going to be roughly that number. I can give that to us exactly, but I don't have a calculator on me right now to do it, which is why we will do this in Google that you all can't see at the moment. Help site, there we go. One meter in inches. 3.3701 inches. So if I go back to D3, we've now set that. So as it moves between those two positions, it will go open and close. You may notice that I named this panel stage rights. The reason I did that is because I'm envisioning this setup as if it's two panels actually that track closed and track back open. So I'm going to duplicate panel stage right and make a panel stage left, which is currently right on top of the panel stage right. And so instead of getting another axis, what I'm going to do is base this one off of the other's axis. So I'm going to make a new screen axis expression, which is going to be rear panel stage left. The expression is going to be negative one times rear panel pause x and the object is going to be panel stage left property offset dot x and so you can see that actually snapped exactly to where I wanted it to be because what happens is we are using the same scaling value set up in the rear panel pause X. But now we are applying that and multiplying it by negative one to the panel stage left. So if I take us back into spike mark, load the open queue and play, Hmm. Only one of them is moving. Now, why would it set up that way? Hmm. There's one thing it did not do when I was testing this. Oh. Well, that would explain that. Stage left here, stage right here. Whoops. I was affecting the same thing twice. Once more with feeling. Now, when we play this open, they separate together. And closing the same way.
So we can use those expressions to link multiple things together. The next piece we're going to look at is actually doing a similar thought, but now we're going to experiment with parenting. So I'm going to start by making a new prop. And that prop is going to be panels null. And we should, as a safety, not leave a space there. And for mesh, I'm just going to go ahead and give it, say, the puffer sphere mesh and make it small. So this null is going to control a bunch of different panels that we're going to put on stage in places. So let's drop a bunch of LED screens. And we're just going to arbitrarily place them. And we're going to child them to our null. So now as the null moves, everything's going to move with it. I'm going to go ahead and drop these ones that I put above down below. So now we have all of those set up so that the parent can drive them in and out. And if we go to devices, this is going to be our flying panels. We're going to attach those to the panels null offset dot y. Currently, the panel is at its out position. We can bring it to, here they are. This is what I want, panels in, play. And so currently, that one is set up to be dropping it down all the way to zero. So for minimum output, we'll just have them fly in a little bit above head height. And then fly them out. Set our maximum and set our maximum to be what its out trim would be. So now they're parented together. So if I run the panels back in, 
we can watch the panels flying into place. Think of that if you're working with a bunch of screens on a truss or a bunch of monitors, we can use that parenting to be able to give us control over a variety of things. And the last we're going to look at is how we deal with this rotation. What I'm actually going to do there is make a video. We'll just go ahead and throw this into it. And for its mapping, I'm going to make a new mapping, which will be all cylindrical track. And so that's going to be a cylindrical mapping. We'll add in the screens of really everything. Uh, Mary Vaughn asks if we can have multiple parents. You can't have multiple parents, but you can have a parent that has another parent and build it that way which is something that I saw being used in a show recently where basically you would drive, it was pretty complex getting everything to be in the proper place. But what they would do is have multiple pivot points. So you drive it to be in line with one pivot point, which is parented to the far pivot point, And you drive the, child pivot point so that everything lines up with the master pivot point and that way you can rotate one or the other and be able to adjust those if that makes sense it's a very it's not a great workflow but it does work so all those displays are added resolution set so let's leave this right in the center Uh, boss parent, master parent, grandparent, all those are fun. Bo says, thank you for doing this. You're quite welcome, Bo. Thank you all for staying with us through all this process. Uh, let's actually just make this 10 by 10 by 10. So the last piece we're going to work with is in the devices, spike mark, turntable rotation Y, object. I can use my all cylindrical tract and property is going to be rotation.y. Zero to 360, zero to 360. And the reason that I'm setting up 0 to 360 is so I can wrap this input. So that way, when it hits 360 on the counter, it can reset. I was noticing a bit of a weirdness if I didn't have that set up properly. So let's go ahead and let's give it, close all of this. Let's give it a rotation. So you can see, this is a horrible piece of content that we're using for it but it does kind of get the impression of what we're doing, playing with the position of that cylindrical mapping. And we get to see these different pieces of it. And I'm going to go ahead and just move it up a little bit also. Position Y. So we get something a little bit more interesting on those panels. This is not a great piece of content I would use for it. This is just a demo to show us how those all come together. What I've been using it for recently is <coughs> either content made to wrap around or use a spherical mapping and spin the spherical mapping and basically load in a 3D video so that you can spin the video around. 
And that way you can track it with the automation of the set. If we go to help sites disguise.one, we'll get a very quick glimpse of that happening. When that glass box that we just saw is rotating, that's actually from a show, Lehman Trilogy, that I just got done programming the Broadway run of, which will hopefully open. And there's a moment where, as the glass box spins, a 3D video is spinning along with it. So you get this really great effect of all of that together. And again, this is our screen position receiver. This is the primary way of doing automation inside Disguise at this point. There's a couple other major topics that we don't want to cover with right now. One of the big ones is for all of these objects, we also have the ability to give it a tracking source. And I found that per Axie, tracking sources are not terribly useful. I'd rather go through this process and find it in the Axies. Tracking source is really useful specifically for if you have cameras or something black tracks that you want to track along with it, but not quite as useful if we're doing just the single axis tracking that we've set up here. So you can see that tracking source is right along here. I can give it the PSN of something to follow it. But then that locks down all these others, and I find that that's not very useful at all. So I've stopped. I tried to tinker with this for this lesson and realized that it's just not what we're looking for. But that brings us to the completion of what I wanted to go over today. Are there any questions about what we've covered? Thank you, Giles. Oh, wow, am I really frozen? It feels like I'm absolutely frozen right now. Hmm. <laughs> Thanks for that, Ian. So I'm just closing some things to try and... Great, perfect. They can at least hear me. So that's the important part. Um, are there any questions about what we've gone over? Interest about anything else? All right, um, seeing nothing popping up in the chat, I'm gonna go ahead and say thank you all for joining me. Uh, oh, wait, here we go. Honest, Adam asked if I, uh, why would I want to mirror a driver like I did with the doors instead of getting another Axie from automation? I'd probably prefer to get another Axie from automation unless they don't have one. I have seen instances where it's a weird, those two doors are tied together. So it's actually just the motor of that closing. And so I need to be able to provide that information to the opposite side. That's kind of the big reason I would use it or looking at expressions to tie into something else, say moving a mapping or something else. You're welcome. Uh, yes, this should be available as video on demand, just coming back to this URL. It was a really great look on my face that I froze on. Thank you, Adam, and thank you, everyone else. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for bearing with us during some of these adventures. And if you are bored Friday, 
join us next time.